Anyone? Yep. The essence of time, I've given you a copy of the tech that I call Detective Vittori. He's an actual medical examiner investigator now, but he was a detective when we worked together. Has an impressive resume. I want to bring you right down to the middle where it says, and it's probably going to be updated, he has investigated over approximately 7,500 deaths. And that, Dave's telling us that, that's probably more. That was two, three years ago. That was two, three years ago. So what we have with us is Dave DeToro from the medical examiner's office. He's a medical legal, which is a term that uh, I've actually had to get explained to me. Uh, it's it's uh, two positions in one. And Dave is the supervising uh, medical uh, examiner investigator. I was also told this morning that it's probably the first time in three years, in three years that he's been allowed. Their time is busy. He texted me last night and said, listen, the body count that stacks up. All bodies that go to medical examiner's office. Wasn't sure if he could get here, but uh, we've been friends a long time. And the medical examiner actually said he could come out and speak to us. So you have that in front of you. It's a good sheet to, we are going to do a reaction paper, which uh, will be be ready to uh, tell us. We'll have the film. It's also being filmed, so we'll have the chance to record it and later. So, without further ado, I'll let uh, Dave do his spiel and, and welcome to Pontic Answer. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Good morning, guys. Uh, well, Mike said I knew Mike for many, many years, probably close to 40 years, and we were not situated. And, um, and I was on John's since 40 years. All right, I am a medical legal death investigator, like Mr. Kalinda said. Medical legal, I do investigations with medical, and I do investigations with legal. And you put the word together, and that's what it comes up with. These are stats from um, last year. In the state of Rhode Island alone, there were over 10,000 deaths that, were, that died in Rhode Island, people died in Rhode Island. But remember, when someone dies in Rhode Island, or any state, you need a doctor to sign a death certificate. Okay? I'm telling you all this now, and I'll make, I'll make sense as the PowerPoint goes on. But anybody who dies in Rhode Island, you need a doctor to sign a death certificate. Last year, we did uh, over 10,000 deaths. 85% of them, or 8,500, was reported to the medical examiner's office. It doesn't mean we took them in and did autopsies on them. Basically, we took jurisdiction over 1,400 of them, over 1,400. Out of the 1,400, we actually did only 668 autopsies when the body came in, put on the table, and the doctors did an exam on it. Uh, there's also two partial autopsies. Those were probably where they, the doctors knew exactly where the bullet was in the body, and instead of doing a whole <coughs> dissection of the, of the body, we just went to that one point to retrieve the bullet, or if it was a heart attack, just to pull the heart out to verify the heart attack or take the brain out just to verify it was a head bleed. We did 329 inspections. These are the cases where single vehicle car accidents, where a guy just went off the road and no one else was involved, there are no charges. We did a, just brought him in, we draw toxicology, we draw tox on every case that comes in. And obviously we're looking for any drugs or alcohol in their system. Um, it's also if somebody commits suicide. If they commit suicide, they leave a note, they do it right now, they do it on uh, Facebook or the actual video themselves. We get a, we'll get quite a few of them. If there's no doubt that the person died due to um, a suicide and the police are satisfied, we just bring the body in, we take pictures, we note any defects on the body, we take down their clothes, we do an inventory, and uh, tox, we go out the door. If you guys have questions as I go on, please feel free to raise your hand. Eight obsessions, we call them IAs, we did over 400 of them. Eight obsession is, if you are in a hospital or in a nursing home for more than 24 hours and you die, there's more documentation on you in the hospital or in the, the nursing home than what the doctor's gonna find in an autopsy. And it's basically all the nurse's notes. So if anybody here wants to be a nurse, prepare on writing, because their notes are so detailed and they're the other ones, our doctors rely on nurses' notes and EMT reports. They rely heavily on those two when they make their decisions. Now, these are people who die 
and they fall under our jurisdiction, and there are no criminal charges. If there was any criminal charges, then they committed the autopsy. These are people like if somebody, if somebody committed suicide, and they've been in the hospital for more than 24 hours, and it's all documented that they committed suicide, how they did it, we call the police. Hey, you know, Jimmy Smith uh, died due to a suicide. Do you have any concerns? And the police will get back to us, say, no, no concerns. We'll say, fine, we're not going to bring them in. We're going to let them go to the funeral home from the hospital. And the doctor signed the death certificates. After facts. After facts are, let me say in this, uh, you need a death certificate. There are two different death certificates in the state of Rhode Island. There's one that only the medical examiner can sign for. And there's one that your own doctor or hospital doctor can sign for. We do get after facts. What happens is the person uh, is reported to us after their doctor or hospital doctor signed the death certificate, and the cause of death falls under our jurisdiction. And I'm going to give you the cause of deaths that fall under our jurisdiction. I should say the manner of death falls under our jurisdiction. In other words, if you die in the hospital due to a heart attack or cancer, the hospital doctor and your own doctor can sign it. But if you go to the hospital and you're in a car accident and you die, that doctor cannot sign the death certificate. Only we can. My doctors can. Okay? I'll explain all that. In cremation, if you want to be cremated, every single cremation in the state of Rhode Island has to come through our desk because we're only looking to see if anything fell through the cracks. That if you died, the, cremate, the cause of death was due to something that falls under our jurisdiction. That's it. You still get cremated. It's just that we have to do the death certificate. It's the same death certificate, only ours are green, and the regular one is yellow or orange. You know who this is? Quincy. 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 Forensic or medical exam to show ever. You guys all know this one, right? OJ Simpson case. This case right here, and Mr. Columbia can tell you, this caused the phenomena of crime scene investigation throughout the country. This show was on. What on the show? She said the show. When this uh, was going on, this trial, Mr. Columbia can tell you. Every morning at 10 o'clock, detectives had it on TV, and we all sitting there watching it just to see how bad they screwed it up. And while they were testifying, the detectives, we were all shaking our heads saying, why did they say that? Why did they do that? We just kept shaking our heads how bad it was. Anyway, because of this show, because of this uh, um, case, everybody wants to get into forensics now. And if it wasn't for this case, we probably wouldn't have this class. Right. I would think. It would have been a hard time getting yeah. a pathway here. Yeah. And because of that show, and the big boom, these shows started coming out, CSI, which I used to watch until one day they showed something and I was arguing, on the, I was screaming at the TV saying it was completely wrong when it came to fingerprints. I was screaming at them, my wife said, you realize this is a TV show? I said, still, and I would watch it again after that one bumble that they did. All right. This is our, uh, our mission statement on our website. Our only job is to determine manner and cause of death. Our doctors are going to say this person died due to a car accident. This person died due to multiple blood force trauma. This person died due to a bullet. This person died to from um, a drug overdose. This person died due to a heart attack. That's the cause of death. Police departments, their investigations has to sell the manner of death. Was it a homicide? Was it a suicide? Was it an accident? Was it a natural death? Or this even another classification where the body is so badly decomposed they can't determine, be undetermined. So my doctors determine the cause, why the person's dead. The police have to do an investigation and sell it to my doctors, the mayor, and the cause of it. We do this through our, our own investigations. Uh, we also go out and get medical records from the uh, thief, uh, from the, parent, the person who died. We sometimes take witness, uh, witness interviews, but basically we leave that to the police. And there's a few times we'll ask the police, we'll get their records, their report, 
And sometimes we have to tell them, okay, you have to go a little further. You're going to get this, you're going to get that for us. And in many cases, um, we have to do the debt scene, our own inspection, which is photography and documentation. My job's a lot of documentation. No matter what we do, we have to document everything before we go on. These are cases that fall under our jurisdiction. Okay, but this is, like I tell the police, because I do talk to the police and batteries, this is your meat and potatoes are accidents, homicides, suicides, and trauma. That is their meat and potatoes, what they do, okay? Fractures. This is very common that falls under our jurisdiction. See, your grandmother or grandfather is walking and stopping shop. They slip and fall and they break a hip. They break a hip, they go get surgery. From surgery, they go over to uh, the nursing home to rehabilitate. While they're at the nursing home, they don't uh, get back to their baseline. They're not fine to go home. They, they become sick or septic and they die. But because of that trauma, for them falling, breaking their leg or whatever, their hip, it falls under our jurisdiction. It doesn't mean we're bringing grandma into cup. It's just that we're going to get all the records and our doctor's going to say, yes, she died or he died due to the nature of the fall, but for the fall. If you can go one step further, this makes sense to you guys. When I first started down there, the veterans home in Bristol had a Vietnam vet that was a paraplegic because he got shot in the back in 1968 in Saigon. He went from Saigon to whatever hospital, and he ended up still going to the VA professional to live. He died due to pneumonia. So when he got called in, I said, okay, no problem. I wrote it out. It wasn't our case. There was a doctor in the room. He went, oh, David, time out. He heard me over here in the conversation. He goes, wait a minute. He says, why is he a paraplegia? I said, a paraplegia because he got shot in the back in 1968. He went, okay. He says, but for that bullet in his back, would he be a paraplegic? I went, no. He said, okay. He says, a paraplegic, he lives 24-7 on his back. He got sick, got pneumonia, and the worst thing to do when you get pneumonia is lay down. You gotta, you gotta move. So with him being a paraplegic, he couldn't move, he couldn't walk around, he ended up getting sick, he ended up getting an infection called sepsis. He became septic, and he died because of it. So my doctor said, if that bullet wasn't in him back in 1968, chances are he would be up and walking around today. He wouldn't be, died, he wouldn't be dead today. So because of that bullet, it's trauma, it falls under our jurisdiction. Okay? That's what we're going to do. It's, it's a real stretch, but we have to find out why the person you know, died. Uh, public places. Believe it or not, the guys own those Twin Rivers in Lincoln. I can't tell you how many debts we get there. Yeah. It's to a point where if you talk to any of the guys in security, you go to, well, you guys are way too young, but once you turn 18 and you're hanging up there, you're only given 20 minutes in the bathroom. There's cameras on the outside of every camp, of every bathroom. If you're in there more than 20 minutes, they come in looking for you. And we do pull them out of there, or in the parking lot, believe it or not. Sudden deaths of a patient who's not seen uh, an attendant uh, physician. Even though there's Obamacare and everybody's supposed to have health care coverage, there's a lot of people who don't, or a lot of people just refuse to go to a doctor. They just hate it. They, they don't trust doctors. They won't go to a doctor. So when the mother or father or, uh, goes home and finds grandma, mommy, daddy dead on the couch, just sleeping, they die naturally, it falls under our jurisdiction because they don't have a doctor to call. See, what happens is if... You report a dead body at home, and it's a natural death, whether you're your grandmother or whoever. An old person who dies at home, you don't call the police. Police come out, they call it into us. And the problem we have when we get all the demographics, we ask the cops, hey, any trauma, any drugs, any alcohol, anything suspicious, does it look like a natural death? And if they say yes, we go, okay, give me her doctor's name, we call the doctor. We call the doctor, and we tell the doctor, hey, sorry to tell you, your patient passed away. And we give them the demographics. And the doctor, nine times out of ten, will say, yes, he is my patient. I will sign the death certificate. He can go to a nurse without a funeral home. So we call back the cops. We go, hey, Dr. So-and-so is going to sign the death certificate. We're not coming out. Send him to the funeral home. And he'll go on his way. But if we have no doctor to call, 
then we're going to come out and get them and bring them in. And then our doctors um, will triage the call. We have a meeting every morning, and they'll triage the call to decide if they're going to do an exam or if they're just going to do an inspect and let the person go off the door. Obviously, all drugs and alcohol deaths are ours. We have to be reported to us. Drugs are coming in right away. Alcohol deaths, unless you're out binge drinking, which happened a couple of years ago with a PC student, if he went out binge drinking and he didn't wake up the following morning, his body came in. But if you're diagnosed as an alcohol, a chronic alcohol, and you've been, you've been drinking for years, that you die due to alcoholism, but that's a natural death. That's not us. And obviously, you guys are way too young, but you guys don't remember uh, the swine flu, H1N1. Anybody who dies due to an infectious disease, an epidemic of infectious disease, and it was like the swine flu that was going around, even though it's a natural death, that comes to mind. Yeah, that doesn't come into us. We have to be tested for it because it's a pandemic. That's why. It's actually a public health. Job. Anybody who dies on the job or on the workplace, right? People want to tell you stories of people who died by machinery on jobs. These are people who was digging a ditch, went down, and died by uh, heart attacks. Those are our cases automatically that are committed. Anybody who is hospitalized or goes in a nursing home or in hospice under 24 hours, under 24 hours, that's 23 minutes, 59 seconds, has to be reported to us. Doesn't mean we're taking it. It has to be reported to us. And we get asked the doctor, what's the cause of death? They say it's a heart attack, definitely not ours, it's a natural death. They say it was cancer or anything like that. We don't want it. But if they say possible drugs, or I don't know, but the person's got a history of alcoholism and drugs, then that's our case. Or the person's been in a car accident, it's automatically ours. Anybody who dies on the table, anybody who dies, that means the doctor either screwed up and hit something they weren't supposed to hit, or a piece of equipment craps out during the um, um, surgery. It has to be reported to us, and depending on the severity of the either mistake by the doctor or a piece of equipment, the body comes in, or we just write a report, and that's it. And then in doubt, I always tell all the cops, um, give us a call. This PowerPoint presentation you're seeing is a watered down version that I give um, the police academy. It's watered down from what I gave at the RI crime school. So I also teach at the crime school uh, for the past 16 years, 17 years, and I give them a talk. Obviously, it's the same PowerPoint basically, only they get more pictures and it's more in depth. And we had a girl, what I did one at Coventry High School, the girl saw it. Next thing I know, I go to the police academy, she saw it again, and then uh, she was lucky enough, she was a little Compton, she went to uh, BCI school, but they're so small. They sent her to BCI school, she had, so she had all four of my presentations. So it does happen. This is the Rhode Island General Law, 2344 to 2360 F-Oz, that's what that means, regular and medical examiner's office. Now we just we don't just work alone. We work with local police, state police, federal, FBI, ATF, uh, NSTB. Uh, we work with all them. We also work with the CDC. And we recover and identify the bodies. You know, like how you see on TV, you see the cops in a hole digging and they're trying to dig up the skeleton and everything. They don't do that. They gotta stop when we come out. And I've been on several skeleton digs to find bodies. We do it. They're just there to protect us. And then if you want to be an organ donor, a donor, if you're an organ donor, a donation, um, we get the last word whether you uh, can donate your organs or not. Because if you're a severe alcoholic or if you're an IV drug user, the doctors don't want your liver or kidneys to be transported, transplanted into somebody else because of health reasons. So we do all the cremation, I mean, uh, approval for trans, uh, transplants. <coughs> Okay, cause and manner, that's what we do. Cause and manner of death. Um, we issue the death certificates, like I told you, we do two different death certificates. We also certify cremation. You want to 
I'm cremated, like I said earlier. Our doctors have to read the, the death certificate of why you're doc, why you're dead, to make sure it doesn't fall under our jurisdiction. And at times we combat, you know, we um, have to present testimony on cases, whether it be a homicide or if it be a civil case, we have to go testify to. In a civil or legal, I spent five days on the stand for a cold case Johnson had just recently. That's how I got those numbers. Um, which one? The one I think I got off of that. Yeah. Yeah. Is that going to trial? No, no true bill. Really? Yeah, the new attorney general tampa. Really? Yeah. So I spent five days testifying for uh grand jury and they tamped it. So yeah. all right. The role of the medical legal death the death investigation is to investigate deaths that fall within our jurisdiction. This right here. If you Google medical legal death investigation, this is what's going to come up. I didn't come up with this. I don't, I'm not saying I'm a better investigator than anybody else. Yeah, when I'm at the PCI school, this is a school that's at the crime lab that only police officers go to that are being trained into crime scene investigation. And I just gave this same talk Friday. And I tell them, look, I'm not saying I'm a better investigator. I see more death scenes than you guys do. So I know just walking in what I'm looking at. Uh, I said, I can get a trooper. There was a trooper there. I said, I have the trooper stand up and recite the motor vehicle code book. That's all they know. His motor vehicle code book inside and out. I can have the, the domestic violence officer stand up and give domestic violence laws because that's all they know. I know death scenes and I see more than that. The medical examiners, the doctors are the medical examiners. They don't go to all scenes. There's only five scenes they will come out to. Other than that, you get named or one of my investigators, you get, yeah, us, you don't get a doctor. What's the reason you see him on TV in Providence all the time, checking up the virus? Uh, I don't think I'll buy this with the investigation. <laughs> we are responsible for just cause and manner, and these are the manners and deaths. Homicides, accidents, suicide, naturals are determined. Those are the five manners and deaths worldwide. They fall under those um, classifications, homicides, accidents, suicide, natural, and undetermined. And I'll explain to you that and I'll show you the cause of deaths and how they all intertwine. And I do have photos to show too. Again, the five possible manners of deaths, that's all there is in the world. These are examples of cause of deaths, okay? Gunshot wound. Gunshot wound could be a homicide. It could be a suicide. It could be an accident. It all depends on what the doc, how the police present it to us. It could be one of those three things. You were three of those uh, manners of death. Multiple gunshot wounds could be a homicide or could be a suicide. I have been on several suicides where the person shot themselves more than once. And it always seemed to be in the head. They just didn't hit anything vital. But I have been on suicides where they shot more than once in the head. Asphyxia. Asphyxia is strangulation. It could be someone came up and choked you out and you died of homicide. It could have been that you were committed suicide by hanging. It could also be an accident, somebody working on a car or something heavy. You know how they got those floor jacks for cars? You are under the car, you're working on it, the jacks kick out and the car lands on you. You can't breathe. You die of asphyxia. So if it falls on the accident, falls on the homicide, falls on the suicide, the police have to sell it to the doctors what it is. Acute drug overdoses, nine times out of ten, they are accidental. Especially now with that fentanyl that's out there. We had three serious fentanyl overdoses overnight. They don't know how powerful it is. And overdose dead body or overdose all Where uh, um, it's an accident. They don't realize it was that powerful the drug. Unless it's without being an accident. But if they left the suicide note saying I couldn't take it anymore, I committed suicide. <laughs> they committed suicide by taking the pills, then it's a suicide. Same thing with the uh, drug under the alcoholic overdoses. It could be a young kid out binge drinking, that's usually an accident. It could be an alcoholic with a cirrhotic liver who's drinking and just dies natural. So our doctors have to determine that between the investigations. Cancer's a natural death, obviously. Wild common infraction is a heart attack. 
that's usually natural. But sometimes a heart attack can be caused by chronic cocaine use. So the doctors have to see if there's anything in their system or if the person has a past history. And then there are some cases the bodies are so badly decomposed, the doctors cannot determine cause of death and they make it an undetermined which is better for the police because years later, we've had, we have a couple of them right now, they thought that they were uh, classified undetermined, and the doctors, are, I mean, the police departments are now coming up with evidence with this cold case that's going on, task force, where we do have suspects and they are being changed to homicides. So you see how that all tangles this one? The Miller body on Hoffman, is that undetermined? Yes, it was. Yeah, I need to take it out. Yes, that's okay, that's in the cold case. Is it? Yeah, the task force. You don't have those cards? They put in the card. I've seen them, but I don't. Uh, I watch them on Channel 12. <laughs> this is the guideline that all police officers have in the state of Rhode Island. We, I gave this out at all the academies. When they call in the death, they have to have these 11 questions answered before we know what we're doing. Basically, me, being a retired police officer, I want to get to the meat and the potatoes. And I think if, I, if I'm going to the scene, I'll get the rest of the information. But I have some investigators that won't go until we have everyone who answers questions, questions answered. But yeah, there's just basic, you know, demographics on the person. So the police officers all have that when you call it in. These are the only five scenes a doctor will come out to the scene. That's it. Other than that, you're going to get somebody like me and me and a doctor to see these five scenes. All homicides, if the body is still at the office, on the scene, they'll go to. Any baby death under 12 months, and the baby's still at the house, not transported, the doctor's gonna go to. This is, this one's really hard, because even if the baby is dead and cold and stiff, the EMTs are gonna transport it anyway, just for hope they're gonna do it. But the ones who stay by, stay back, they will, um, the will come over that there. Anybody five or more who died in an incident, and all five bodies are at the scene. Not four at the scene, one at the hospital, three at the scene, two in the hospital, and then dead. Five or more at the scene, a doctor's gonna come out. What's the what's the reason for that? Uh station fire. They want to come oh, up with okay. a number. Okay. You know? They want to look for a number. They said the most will go is five. If there's five or more, we're going out. Anybody who dies in a cell block whether it be wide detention, ACI, or your local police department, a doctor's gonna come out or find the person who's dead, whether it's natural, or whether you committed suicide, or the cops is gonna look too heavy handed. They're gonna come out for that. In any and all deaths um, that are out there, we tell the police to give us a call and we'll question them. And the reason why we question them is because our doctors work in the morning if I'm going to pull a doctor out at 2, 3 in the morning, it better be for one of these other four reasons. If I just pull them out for a routine drug death or a natural death, they're going to be really mad at us in the morning when they're going to come back into work. Other questions? You got this interest. I'm not boring you. This is something I tell the detectives in the, in the school. Not everybody wants to go to an autopsy. It's not normal somebody taking apart a person. It's not normal at all. So a lot of cops don't want to go. I've had investigators come in and throw up. I had med students who passed out. I had one doctor who was a, an intern wanted to get into the field of forensics. Lasted two hours, says, you know what? This ain't for me. He turned around and walked out. And he went into another field of medicine. So it's not for everybody, and we tell the detectives, you have to at least make contact with the doctor doing the investigation, or doing the autopsy, so we understand what you're looking for and tell you realistically what we can do for you. Okay? We've actually had one one cop ask, can you take the eyeballs out, put it on a special machine, and see what the last image was? No. You can't do that. You don't want to do that. Exactly that. It's called the CSI effect. So our doctors want to bring all the cops down to realistic what can actually happen, what we can do. You know, if someone's found at the bottom of the stairs, whether they tripped and fell or whether somebody pushed, we're not going to find a hint for it on the body. We're just not going to. We're not gonna, that's not to the cop and do more investigations for that. But we like to have the detectives come in and um, 
explain to the doctors how and when the doctors can ask all the questions. You do want the BCI officer or the evidence tech to come in because any evidence we receive, we retrieve off the body, it's turned over to them right away. If they do come in, you want them to take their scene photos and at least the first page of the report. Yep. You don't keep any evidence in? Yeah, it's all turned over. It's all turned over. Back to the police. Back to the police. This way, if there's a screw up somewhere, so we'll see what you want to sign out for. Weapons. Back to the day. <coughs> You should remember, and we used to take the weapons. Yeah. Not anymore. We don't take weapons anymore. It's going to be up to the cops. Where I'll go to a scene and I'll tell a cop, look, it's a shooting. I'll take my pictures and I'll tell the cop, hey, you have to retrieve the weapon and we're under a safe. And I'll be honest with you, I can tell you horror stories how the cops do not know how to make a weapon safe. And I've ripped guns out of cops' hands, even out of my own guys' hands in the morgue. Because they don't know how to handle guns, and I'll just reach, wriggle, and grab it from them because I don't want to get hurt. Uh, so we don't have weapons. They better bring the weapons, the firearms, knives, bottles, baseball bats. They better bring them because during the autopsy, the doctor doesn't want to try to match up the wounds with that evidence, piece of evidence. They will do that. We'll document with photos. And if they take, and if a firearm has to come in, it has to be completely empty. I've had one cop come in with a revolver completely loaded. Doesn't matter, it's not going to go off unless you play with it. But all my doctors were flipping out. And I asked the cop, why did you come in with a loaded weapon? And my chief said, don't touch the barrel, uh, the cylinder. Uh, it was a small town downtown of South Carolina. So. That's who has to come to autopsies. Identifying people. Everybody wants to do DNA. Fast track DNA takes 18 days. Say that again. Fast track DNA is up to fast track is 18 days. Uh, CSI does it in yeah, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. And if you're going to do a full one, it could take up to six to eighteen six to eighteen months if you have to send it out. But fast track is what is 18 days, and that is a long. That our DNA people putting all their stuff behind and working on just that. So. What we like to do for, for identification, the best thing is fingerprints, dental records, photo ID from the registry, tattoos. If anybody has a unique enough tattoo, we can ID the person in that way. We don't do no IDing at the office. In other words, it's not like TV, we don't have drawers. And I think I got a photo of our cool. We don't have drawers where you pull up the body and say, is this so and so? No, we don't do that to the family. If we don't want to even down there, but if we have to come down, we're only going to show them a photo of the person. That's it. If for any reason... Talking family member? Family member, yeah. If for any reason we have to do a one-on-one -on -one with the body actually there, we will call the police department and say, hey, look, so-and-so's coming down. You have to bring an escort just in case they flip out. You have to be there for our protection because we don't have a facility. We don't have a room. We used to have a room until too many fights broke out. And the, and the powers to be in my office says break up the room, and now it's just the office, a conference room. But we used to do that. But nobody, uh, it's only going to be a family member. And the reason why we really did away with this, we've actually had families come in, say, yeah, that's mommy. Thank you. And they go out the door. That's the wait. And they turn around, they leave, and mommy's with us for years. They won't do anything. So that's another reason why we stopped it. Okay, fingerprints, this is me, this is an actual case. <clears throat> this gentleman was so badly decomposed, when the, the bodies get badly decomposed, they actually, their skin actually gets peeled off. We knew we had a police record, so what I did was I gloved his thumb, took his thumb off, put it on top of my thumb, and fingerprint it, to match it up with the fingerprint document, the ID. So that's his dead finger, or skin of his dead finger on my, on my index. When I say tattoos, if you've got a unique enough tattoo like that, it looks like it's pretty much homemade, you'll make an ID. Whether it's that unique or this elaborate, you'll make ID. This is a real, this was a good one. This is a person that was murdered, set on fire. And in this photo here, you can just look at the tattoo. 
Well, with an infrared camera, if you take a picture of that, you can actually make it out. And we identify the guy like that. Estimating time of deaths, that's just what it is, it's estimating. It's not like TV, I can't say the person died between 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock yesterday morning. No, I can't say that, and I'll never say that, nobody will. We have to do an estimate by these four um, categories. And when we go to a death scene, we actually touch and play with the body, and I'll explain it to you. Post-mortem morbidity. This is the clip note, or this is the definition off the internet, and we the clip notes. Post mortem morbidity. You're standing up, you're alive, your heart's pumping, your blood's circulating. You die, your heart stops, you fall down to the ground. The lowest point of your body, all your body fluids are going to settle, including your blood. So it's going to settle down to your lowest part of your body, whatever's touching the ground, and it's going to stain your capillaries. And depending on your body size and the temperature, us playing with the body, We'll be able to tell the person died within four hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, or the person's been dead more than 18 hours. When we do that, okay, this is a person who died. This is a okay? I got this off the internet. You can see when he died, when she or he died, the back and the buttocks must have been touching the floor. So the blood came down, the lividity, stained the body, but because there was pressure on the buttocks and in the back, the blood couldn't get there. It's like a water balloon. You know like how you squeeze a water balloon and it goes off to the side? It's like that. It went off to the side. So we know that the person died on the back. Now, if I go to a scene and this person's on their stomach and I go to the cop, anybody touched them? They went, no. I went, no. This person's been moved because the person was definitely died on their back and the blood settled. So somebody, somebody, moves, somebody right. moves them. Exactly. Now, if I get my fingers, which we do, and we press inside the lividity, if it makes marks, our fingerprints come out with a white mark, the person's been dead only a short time. If the person, if the marks don't go anywhere, the person's been dead for probably 12 hours plus. Rigor mortis. Rigor mortis is your muscles, the chemicals in your muscle changes when you die. And they'll stiffen right up in a matter of hours or minutes if you have like I think it's one percent body fat and something like that. And what it does is it starts to you know tighten up your muscles. So if there's a dead body at the scene, when I'm all done pushing into the red area, I play with the arm. If I go like this, it looks like we're having a, an arm wrestle, it goes out nice and slow. The person just recently died, probably within three hours, four hours. If I go like this and the whole body's coming up and it's stiff. Person's been dead probably 12, 15 hours. And if I go like this and it's hard, then snaps. I broke rigor probably 18 hours to 20. And if I go like this and it's like a, a rag doll, we're talking well over 24 hours, the person's been dead. This is off the internet. If you Google the Memorial Images, this is the first one's going to pop up. This guy's in full rigor. And you know, I like this picture also because you can tell he died on his back. Buttocks is white with all the lividity. He's on the back side. Temperature, we're not like TV. We're not going to stick a thermometer in the person. We can't do that. I don't think any, country, any jurisdiction in the country does it. That's just what TV. What we do is we put our hands underneath the arms and their arms in between their legs. And then we want to know if they're warm, cool, or cold. Yeah, that's it. You guys want to come in? Come on in. Come up, have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. Mm -hmm. What do you think? What we do is we see if it's warm, cool, or cold, and we report the temperature in the room. Insects. You do not collect insects unless you don't collect insects unless the body is skeletonized. That is it. And the reason why we do that is so the doctors can determine how long the person's been, been dead. If the body's skeletonized. This is a scene where they recovered two bodies out of the cesspool. And what happened was the two bodies were in the socks, they were 
um, two bodies in the cesspool with my investigator along with state police who had to climb in to pull the bodies out on the cesspool, and that's the murder weapon. What it was was it ended up being the son went up to the mother and the father and hit them both in the skull with that kid on. Yeah. yeah. This is one of the car accidents. This is what happens when a car meets a train, the Excel. The Excel is going to win every time. Okay. This was a sad case. This was a girl who left um, the Muse down in uh, Narragansett, uh, South Kingston, and got lost and went from a paved road to a dirt road to boom, she's on the tracks. And I don't believe how it happened, but like five months later, I had to go down to the same spot for a dry uh, for a drug overdose on the tracks, and I'm driving down. This was during the daytime, and I said, "Oh my God, I can see how this poor girl got confused because you're just driving down the street on down the paved road, turns into dirt, and then bang, you're right on the tracks, the train tracks." And she got up on the train tracks, and the car got stuck. And the Excel just came by and hit her. And unfortunately, um, that part of the state down in Exeter. That's the only spot in Rhode Island that the seller can go up to 200 miles an hour until it gets water or at least drainage. This was a gentleman who was not familiar with firearms. Um, this is a black powder gun. And if you don't know about black powder guns, he did. Uh, you pour a little bit of powder on the, the barrel. You put the primer in by the hammer. You put the bullet down the barrel, and you pack it, and you shoot your dad. This guy, he wanted to commit suicide. He went to Dick's Sporting Wood, bought the gun, packed the entire barrel with powder, packed it and packed it and packed it. Put the ball ammo in it, put the primer in it, laid down in his kitchen and pulled the trigger, and he actually almost had a plate bomb in his hand, and it went off. This is, the reason why I show you this is for matching evidence. This person um, was murdered downtown. It's a shotgun. You guys are familiar, the guy's not familiar with shotgun. This is the little buck. It's nine pellets right here. Nine pellets went through his shirt right here. What happened here was this gentleman, or this young kid, stood up and walked by a window, and the shooter on the other side thought it was somebody else and just pulled the trigger. And the first cop on scene was smart enough to grab his shirt. Because um, if you don't know EMTs, medical personnel, they go right to where the blood's coming from or the place of the trauma, and they cut and they destroy this evidence. So he was the first one to get there, wanted to the exam, and we can match it right up. These are some implements that are used for suicide deaths, hanging guns, obviously, knives. Helium tanks, which are very popular right now to do to commit suicide. The way they're doing it is by putting a bag on the head, buy a helium, helium tank, get some tubing, put the tube in the bag, and turn it on. This is a liver. This is a very healthy, healthy liver. This is your uh, roll bladder. It's about the size of your pinky right here. This is very healthy. It's a healthy liver. This is somebody who's a severe alcoholic and been diagnosed an alcoholic. You can see all the cancer nodules all over the place, and this is in the of how big it is. If you get this far, there's no turning back. The, 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 the liver can't uh, identify itself. This is a hop. This is cool because the doctors can tell if you had a heart attack or not. I hope you guys can see the black piece right here. That's dead muscle. That's how the doctors can tell if it's a heart attack. That usually shows up with a few hours after you have your heart attack. <coughs> this is a DNA card. Everybody who comes in our office, we get toxicology, we get DNA. And we keep these cards forever. And the reason why we keep these forever is your great great granddaughter or grandson could say, hey, th I think my, back in 2011 or 2020, my great-great-grandfather murdered my great-great-grandmother by a poison that we're not checking out. We can pull this card out and check that little blood, that little blotch of blood. Or we've been using this recently in cold cases to determine if it's, if it's 
were from um, the victim or from the assailant. These here is called histology. These are samples from histology. During the exam, the doctors take a sample of every organ and they put them in these little cassettes. We set these cassettes out to a company that embeds these cassettes in wax. And then they put them on like a deli slicer and they slice it really thin and they put them on these slides. Then the doctors get these slides and they put them underneath the microscope and they can see if there's any diseases in the organs. And we keep these forever. I have found these going back to the 60s in the office for the same reason. If for 40, 50 years from now, they want to see if this person had an exotic drug in their system or whatever, or they think they had a disease that we were testing for, we can pull it and have it done. We are located down, down by the Marriott in downtown, Wall Street, that's our building. All the drug um, labs and uh, toxicology labs and the bioterrorism labs are all on the front of this building on these four floors. We're on the side of the building in the basement. On the left side, we're in the basement. We're not well liked there because we stay the place up most of the time. But we're on the left side of the building. That's the medical, that's the autopsy suite. That's where we bring the bodies in and we start cutting up the bodies. This is Dominique. She left us to become a doctor. She was one of my investigators. She left. And what she's doing is the body comes in. Body gets weighed, she measures him how tall he is, then she brings him over to one of these stations. I think she's gonna use the middle one, locks the table into the station, and then that's Dominique, and that's our Dr. Alex, who's still with us. And again, you guys can see this is an organ. What happens is Dominique will do a Y incision. Okay? They'll stop pulling out the body, the order the organs. They get weighed. What you don't see is right between the legs, there's a stainless steel pan and all the organs go in the pan. The doctor grabs them, put them up on a cutting board, and they just start slicing away. He's looking for any diseases or any uh, thing that's abnormal in the organs. And then you can see these pink cassettes. That's where he's saving a piece of each organ for histology. How long does the autopsy take? If it's a normal straight out autopsy, it could take. <coughs> 45 minutes to an hour, but I have had autopsies that were in for two days, multiple stab wounds. These are our trucks that transport the, um, the decedents from the scene. That's our livery company. Oh, I'm sure. okay. All right, and like, uh, what's the point of the surprise to realize that we be in that office 24-7. There's always somebody on call. Somebody's always in-house there. 24-7, 365. 365 days a year. Um, nights, weekends, there's only one investigator. During the week, there's like five of us on duty. And um, like I tell the detectives or the police officers when I do the academies, I say, look, it, it pretty much comes down to prioritize triage the calls if they come in, if we have a couple of calls at the same time. Well, last week it happened where I had, we had a Middletown scene. One of my investigations were going to middle, investigators were going to Middletown. He must have been 20 minutes into the call. Well, Smithfield called in a death. I said, you guys, you're gonna have to wait until he comes back. And then he, the cop says, okay, that's fine. And then I hang up the phone, the phone rings again, it's one socket. And they had a death. So what ended up happening was by the time he came back, the next investigator was coming in. She said, she'll take them. So the call came in like at two o'clock, 2.30. They didn't get to all three, they didn't get to the other two scenes until well after six, seven o'clock at night. Mind you, the police are on scene. And they're on scene, they're securing the scene and everything. They're, 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 nobody yeah. wants to wait. Yeah, that, that, that's just it. You know, no one wants to wait and be the next cop. You know, it's like, come on, let's go, come on, hurry up, let's get this going. Yeah. And that's it, that's all I got. Um, any questions, comments, concerns? Dave, you've been down there uh, quite a few years. Yeah. 15. What would you say is probably the, one of the worst investigations you've know, as far as going, going to the scene? And I'm trying to think. I got Ray Pin coming in next week. Yeah. Can you do that scene? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the double? Yeah. yeah. I'll be honest with you. That's when I was a police officer. 
That's the only autopsy that bothered me. Those two right there. Those were two young kids. Still to this day, they're the only two that bother me. It's because those were two young kids who were just out on Friday night. They didn't do anything to anybody. They were just objects of opportunity. That's all they were. That's all they were. And Ray's going to tell you how they got passed. Like yeah. three or four times. They got passed. They got passed by by the bad guys. Saying that they're only college kids. They're going to have nothing on them. And he's going to tell you the stories about how they tried robbing three or four other people, but there was people around. They said, screw it. And then they said, you know what? Let's go back see if those two kids are still hanging out of the car. And they end up, uh, you know, hij uh, hijacking them. That's the only one. Probably the worst scene I ever saw was about maybe two years ago. It was on 195 East Providence, coming to Providence, track the trailer, work van, track the trailer. For some reason, this track the trailer jacked up, stopped. The van hit the rear end of him. This track the trailer came through, came through and squashed him. Like, I was on scene, I thought I had two vehicles. I'm standing there and they're trying to do the, you know, extract the victim out of the car, out of the van, and I thought it was two trucks. Until they says, no, there's three. I'm like, three? They're all white. I go, what do you mean they're three? There's three trucks. That's a, that's a minivan. That's a work van. And um, yeah, the person got hit so hard. There was two people in the car, in the van. They got hit so hard, they went into the engine. That's how hard they got killed. They got hit. And they probably didn't feel anything. Just that the car, the truck in the front just jacked up. He hit them. This one came by and boom, plowed right in. That's probably the worst thing I've ever seen. I'll tell you, what I learned is I thought every that that wasn't natural causes was a, was an autopsy, but it's no, not. No, it's not. So I learned that. Ask report Right, ask report reported. If you die before you're supposed to die, right. you have to find out a reason why. How many bodies? Do you have a body count right now at the Emmy's office? As of right now, I had to do a count because because of the holidays, no one wants to get funeral home. So right now we have twenty five bodies in house right now. They're all done. They're all autopsy. They're all ready to go. We just wait for funeral homes to come pick up. We have twenty five. We get bold comfortably about forty to forty five. We get comfortably. After that, we get to start calling the funeral home saying, hey, look, you're taking care of Mrs. Jones. You're going to come here and get up. Right. So that's, you know, this uh, free up space, which we were doing Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, because we were pretty close to the capacity. 50 bodies. Yeah, comfortably. Yeah. Um, you know. What's going to happen is uh, Dave's going to leave, and then I'm going to get about 35, 40 questions. But I have his, that's fine. I have his email. Uh, <coughs> he's, a, he's a good contact. We are going to do a reaction paper to uh, not so much the information that he gave us, because it's lengthy. We do have it on video. But as far as oral presentations, uh, Dave's a great speaker. But obviously, he has a ton of knowledge in his, in his head. Uh, you don't realize the amount of expertise that this detective had, not only as a BCI guy, but as a crime scene investigator, that they entrust him to go out and teach police academy recruits uh, to the school. All uh, three academies. So uh, and, uh, and Dave's got a busy day, so uh, please, uh, uh, thanks Dave. Uh, I know Dave uh, cleared his schedule. Last night I got a text. He said, listen, the body counts a little high on though. It's, uh, I'm not sure if I can get it. I said, listen, no problem. We can always reschedule, but I was glad, I was glad to have you come out here. I'm glad, and like he said, uh, you girls missed it. Uh, this is the first class in probably three years I did in high school. So, and, really and I have, when I called Dave, I had to actually, uh, who did I have to talk to? The uh, My new administrator. New administrator. And she was very. Oh, yeah, she is, yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Yes. So, I, uh, we'll send her. Uh, <coughs> yeah. We'll send her there, you know.